History is full of Christians who dare to dream the impossible. What is your dream? What seems so unachievable that it frightens you? Something that would require a plan. A strategy that combines creativity with reality. That brings heaven to earth. Where preparation is just as important as inspiration. Because the challenge of the ascent is just ahead. You're filled with joy and excitement as you fulfill your God-given purpose while staying numb to the weights of fear and doubt as you reach your limit. And you will reach your limit because no God-given dream is ever achieved easily. But he shows himself faithful to finish what he's called you to start. All of this to achieve the impossible. Summit. Amen. So this Sunday we are um, we're covering the topic of of planning because you know what good is a dream without a plan? You know some concrete steps to get it off the ground to to do it. And the first thing that I want to do this morning is kind of clarify our definition of what a plan is. And so before I do that, I'm gonna pray <laughs> because I don't want this to be my definition, I want this to be God's, all right? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity, for the freedom and the liberty to come here and worship you with other believers. Thank you for the privilege to discuss and to learn and to reveal your truth in the body of believers. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide our thoughts, guide our minds and our hearts so that this may grow to build your church. In your precious name we pray, amen. Amen, so a plan. Um, first, I wanna clarify that to plan does not mean to control. A plan is not explicit expectations. A plan is simply ideas rooted in creativity and stewardship to achieve something. So whenever I say plan, I mean this is a creative idea. This is one way to do this impossibility. And there are many ways. And I, I, I wanna clarify the fact that a plan is, is a creative idea because you are all creators. You all have the power and the privilege of creativity. You do not have the power and the privilege of control. Amen? So, plan is just our creative stewardship to do this thing that God has put in front of us, to live this life, to achieve this dream. Amen? So let that be the foundation, let that be the filter that we discuss anything this morning. All right? A lot of times we read scripture and we, we pick out this word plan to, to, to shoot down, like, you can't plan God. You can't plan your life. You can't you can't plan that. And I understand the idea is you can't control life and you can't control God. And I agree with that 100%. But you do have a responsibility to steward your life. You do have the responsibility to plan, to use the resources, the tools, the gifts, the people around you to live life, to achieve that thing that God has put in your place. And a lot of times we read Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. We read this scripture and it says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And we read that and we say, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but. And we read that but as to say like, totally negate what I've just said. What I'm about to say is what you really need to focus on. And that's true, but this, this scripture is saying, many are the creative ideas in the mind of a man. Man's imagination can go anywhere, right? <laughs> many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Your creative ideas have the authority and the privilege to go out in this world. But ultimately, it's the purpose of the Lord 
that will stand. And so when we plan our life, it's important to do it through that filter, through that motive, through that intention. I'm going to do everything in my power. I'm going to do everything in my creativity, but ultimately understand that it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And that gives me hope because no matter what happens, no matter how my plan, my life, my expectations may face a hiccup, I understand and I'm rooted in the faith and the hope that the purpose of the Lord will stand. And so by the end of this message, I hope to clarify and to solidify and to reinvigorate us with the hope of what the purpose of God is in your life, in my life, in our lives, because it's all the same, honestly. All right, so we've established what a plan is. A lot of times when we think, I need to make a plan, I need to figure out how to do this, we think I need wisdom, I need some knowledge, I need insight, right? I need to know how to do this. In the Bible, there's three books that's considered wisdom literature, Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And out of those three, I can pretty much assume that everybody wants to gravitate towards Proverbs. Because, right? Amen. Because Proverbs, Proverbs is full of topical insights. It's full of one-liners that are easy to digest, that clarify cause and effect. If you do this, this will happen. And it's a lot of insight into our world, like this is the way these things happen. It's very important, I do want to stress, not to read the book of Proverbs as if they are all promises. That's the kicker, all right? And I want to use one scripture to clarify that Proverbs, it's, it's, it's like you're, you're getting to peek into the hole of how things work, but... It's not always how that works. The scripture, raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they will depart, they won't, uh, when they grow, they will not depart from it. All right? I want to clarify that if you declare that over your life, declare that over your children as a promise, you're asking to do something, you're asking God to do something that is not really his heart. It is his heart that your children grow up to serve God and know God and not depart from the way. But God's will is not that he would control your children. Okay? So it's important when we read the book of Proverbs to understand that these are, I don't want to use the word probabilities, but these are, this is good stuff. This is wisdom. If we were to live in a perfect world, this is exactly how it would go. All right? And we love Proverbs because we love to think that we live in a perfect world, but we don't. And so we do our stuff. We steward and creatively raise up our children in the way. But sometimes, and we say this with, with a bit of a broken heart, sometimes when they grow up, they don't, they don't stay. Right? Right? If you read that scripture, if you understand that as wisdom in parenting, not simply as a promise of control, you understand that many are the plans in the mind of a parent. But in the end, the purpose of the Lord will stand. So that's the promise you stand on, all right? I wanted to go on that little rabbit trail to, to, to show you that Proverbs is full of wisdom, and we love that because it's easy to digest. It's easy to think that we can just use those one-liners to create and to plan this beautiful life. But in light of the fact that we live in an imperfect world, Proverbs seems a bit too simplistic and a little incomplete. And if you were to just read one book of the Bible for the rest of your life, you would be looking at an incomplete book because Proverbs is not meant to stand on its own. We have three books that's considered wisdom literature in the Bible. Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. So, my challenge this morning is to move over into Ecclesiastes. And it's hard, because Ecclesiastes is full of one-liners that are not easy to digest. Over 35 times, there's this phrase that's used that says, life is meaningless. 
that doesn't seem like wisdom from God on how to, how to live my life. But it, I want to clarify something. Ecclesiastes, there's two voices in the book of Ecclesiastes. I hope this is good stuff for you. I know that it's, I'm not telling funny stories about my garden, but I, this is good <laughs> stuff, all right? Ecclesiastes, there are two voices in Ecclesiastes. The first is the teacher, and the second is the author. The majority of the book of Ecclesiastes is the teacher. What, what someone would say, uh, let's call him a middle-aged critic. No offense to the middle-aged individuals. A middle-aged individual who has lived life, who knows how things work. You know, the fact that we have Proverbs, but we live in an imperfect world, so sometimes this is actually how things happen, all right? The critic, the, the teacher, speaks for the majority of the book, the first 11 chapters. And then the author steps in in chapter 12 to, to clarify things, to wrap things up. And I say that because you can't just, you can't, so Proverbs is easy to just pick like, you know, Proverbs 19:21. there's a one-liner, I can, you know, run my day on that. You cannot run your day on one verse out of Ecclesiastes because if you pick life has no meaning, you're not getting out of bed, right? <laughs> there's no room for creativity if you take a one-liner out of Ecclesiastes, all right? But it's important, Ecclesiastes is important for your life, it's important. So Ecclesiastes, we have this, this one phrase, um, everything is meaningless, and a lot of translations use that word, meaningless, because language, just translation between languages is it's a tricky thing. We definitely don't have the wisdom on that. But the, the real word, the original word for that meaningless is hevel, hevel, H-E-V-E-L, and he says everything is hevel, hevel, hevel. Everything is hevel. And, and we translate that word as to say meaningless or vanity or empty. And I cannot accept that, and I don't believe the church can accept that, to say that life is meaningless, that life is empty, that life has no meaning. We cannot accept that. That is not wisdom. The thing here, he's using a metaphor. Everything is hevel. A better thing would to say everything is like a smoke, which, this is a funny thing, the message translation actually does a better job <laughs> at giving us the wisdom and the insight of Ecclesiastes, at least in my opinion, not that it's worth much. So Ecclesiastes, you want to uh, get that up? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, uh, verse 2. Smoke, nothing but smoke. That's what the quester says. Quester is another word for teacher. There's nothing to anything. It's all smoke. He's saying it's, it's a metaphor. Life is like smoke. It's beautiful and mysterious. Smoke exists. It's a thing. Life exists. It's a thing. It's beautiful and mysterious, light smoke. It seems to be one shape and then it takes another. Life seems to be going one way, but then all of a sudden it takes another. Uh, it looks solid, but the moment that you try to grasp smoke, it just goes through your fingers. The moment you try to grasp life, to control it, to expect something out of it, it just, you can't grab it. It's like smoke. And then in the thick of it, you can't see clearly. In the thick of life, in the thick of activity, in the thick of everything going on, in the thick of trying to figure it out, we just can't see clearly. So the beautiful thing about Ecclesiastes is, yes, it provides these dark truths that we need to understand about life, but it uses this beautiful metaphor to understand that you can't control life, Proverbs. You can use the wisdom to build a good life, to steward your life, to be creative, but you can't use it con to control it because life is like smoke. Your life is like smoke, here one day, gone the next. And that's why Ecclesiastes brings up three <laughs> really dark, I, and when I say dark, I don't mean evil, I mean just like deep truths. It's basic, but it, we don't like to stay there. The first thing is the fact that time moves on. Time moves on. 
And that's a truth that you need to understand as you live your life. Success in your life is not ultimate success because you are here one day and gone the next. And I say that to my own self. Success in my life does not determine eternal success. I am not the ruler. I am not the maker of all. Success, according to God, is what overarching defines success. And he's already got the victory, so that's, that's a thing. The second thing is everyone dies. Y- again, you get that one-liner out of Ecclesiastes, you're not getting out of the bed. Everyone dies. It's a truth. And it's, it's a truth that you need to understand and take stock of as you live this life, as you go after to creatively build and achieve those awesome things. And again, I, I can hear it in your minds, like these, this is not the way that you pump me up to climb a mountain, Jason. <laughs> this is not the way that you pump me up, but it's important. Empty cheerleading does not build the kingdom of God. We have to take stock of reality, which is what Ecclesiastes put forth. We have to take stock that time moves on and everyone dies. And the third point is life seems random. And when I say life seems random, I want to be careful not to say that life is random. Because if you look at from an eternal, from a heavenly, from God's perspective, life is absolutely not random. But if you look at it from your perspective, life can seem pretty random. Random. Random enough that a flood would hit our region at the 1st of August. Pretty random to say that a family member just suddenly passes away. Life seems random, and it's so, it's important to take into consideration the reality that Ecclesiastes sets forth. These, this, these things that we don't like to digest, the things that we don't like to put on the table when we talk about achieving awesome and great and just wonderful things, but it's important to take stock of them because it's going to, it's going to help us along the way. Because while you can't control everything, the one thing that you can control is your perception. You can control your attitude. You can control your opinion of what's going on. And so if your attitude, if your opinion, if your judgment is towards this is my plan to build a good life and your attitude and your perception isn't on the refrain of the verse that says the purpose of the Lord will stand forever, you're going to get mixed up and we're going to have to sing a song to encourage you. (laughs) But if we can mature ourselves enough to take stock of the hard realities of life, then we can encourage ourselves in the thick of it. Not to say that we shouldn't encourage one another, but if you're on the side of a mountain, I'm using a metaphor, we can't sing Kumbaya to encourage everybody. There are going to be points in the church's history when we cannot stop and have an awesome service where we just declare down the presence of God. There are times when you're going to be on your job. There are going to be times when you're in the hospital room where you just need to encourage yourself and you need to take stock of the hard realities of life. (sighs) It says, I have done everything in my power to steward and to be creative in this life that you've given me, Lord. But I stand on the promise that in the face of hard realities, your purpose will stand forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Ecclesiastes complements, and I would even say completes Proverbs. So please do not start a reading plan just focusing on Proverbs. You're setting yourself up for, you're putting on the wrong glasses. (laughs) Uh, It's important to take stock of both. And I say Ecclesiastes complements it because it says, yes, we can use this wisdom. Yes, we can use these truths to govern and to steward this life. But again, take stock of these hard realities. You're setting yourself up for success. What it's actually doing, the author steps in in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. So you have the critic, you have the teacher's voice for the first 11 chapters giving us these hard realities of life. And then you have the author who steps in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Verse 8 through 14. I'm going to use the message because they did it so beautifully. 12 and 8. 
It's all smoke, nothing but smoke. The quester says, the teacher says that everything's smoke. And here's the author speaking. Besides being wise himself, the teacher also taught others knowledge. He weighed, examined, and arranged many proverbs. The quester did this best to find the right words and write the plain truth. Thank God for truth. The words of the wise prod us to live us well. They're like nails hammered home, holding life together. They are given by God, the one shepherd. But regarding anything beyond this, dear friend, go easy. Beyond these three hard truths, go easy. There's no end to the publishing of books and constant study wears you out, so you're no good for anything else. The last and final word is this. Fear God and do what he tells you. And that's it. Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden intent, whether it's good or evil. The last and final word is this, fear God. Focus on the refrain of Proverbs 19.21. It is the purpose of God that will stand forever. I fear him. I acknowledge that he is God. I acknowledge his definition of good and evil. I acknowledge his definition of cause and effect. I acknowledge the hard realities that he has sent forth in this life, that we are not physically immortal. There comes a day when we will die, but my soul will live on. My spirit lives on because my hope is in him. My hope is in his purpose. Do what he tells you, just like pastor said. Do what he tells you. And it's not this hard nose, do this or die. It's this, do this and live. Yes, it's this, use these... It's like your teacher is saying, use these crayons to paint a picture. And you're like, I don't want to use crayons. Well, it's like, you got nothing else. That's the only way that you can paint this picture. Do what he says and lives. Take, take the wisdom, take the insight, take the knowledge, take the promises that he's given you. And build this awesome life that you were destined to build. Amen? Amen. That's it. Everything God will bring Eventually, God will bring everything that we do out into the open and judge it according to its hidden intent, whether it's good or evil, whether it's good or evil. And so the author of Ecclesiastes kind of ties in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Fear the Lord. Proverbs stress that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom understanding that God is Lord, that God is creator, that God is the ultimate designer. That is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of wisdom. The cool thing about Proverbs, the cool thing about biblical wisdom in general, is that it's open to anybody. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask and he'll give it to you. And the verse goes on to say, without fault. Th this wisdom is open to anybody. Anybody. Anybody can delve into the Bible to discover cause and effect and the hard realities of life to build a good life. But what Ecclesiastes does is wraps it up by saying, in the end, God will bring it all to light. God will show if we use this for his purpose or for our control. And so it's important to be rooted in his purpose. So Ecclesiastes, the author of Ecclesiastes, links up Proverbs and Ecclesiastes because it's important. Those are, you can't just have the one-liners easy to digest, but you also can't focus on the hard realities because you'll never get out of bed to do anything. And then we have the story of Job, and I do not have time this morning to delve into the story of Job. But I believe God showed this to me. I haven't found it anywhere else, but I believe God showed this to me, this, this something that seems like just out in the open for anybody to see, and it helped me to understand the purpose of God, me, like assigned to my life, associated in my life. And it's like one of those things 
I thought about this morning. It's like one of those things. Did you know that July, August, September, October, November spelled Jason? July, August, September, October, November. The first letter of those months spell Jason. And there's no like, he's supposed to be the ruler of the world. It's, it's not that kind of truth. It's just like this, that's funny. That's, that's kind of cool. That, you know, for me, it's like, that's, I belong here. <laughs> I belong in an English-speaking country. <coughs> but I, <laughs> you're like, you've lost me, Jason. But I, I was looking at the books of the Bible, and something similar popped out to me. And it's not the first letter of the books of the Bible or anything like that. It's, it's the secession. It's the placement of the books. And so we have Job. And I'm going to do this opposite me so that you can see the progression. We have Job, the story of one man, which highlights how he used wisdom to build an awesome family, a great legacy, a wonderful reputation, but we also saw some hard realities come to play in that whole mess. Amen? Amen. It was God's mess. It wasn't my mess, but not that it was a mess, just he had it. Anyway, <laughs> a lot of times we get stuck in the story. Whether it be one man's story or our own story, we get stuck trying to figure it out. Why did this happen? I did everything that I was supposed to. This seems pretty random and jacked up. What, what's going on? This, I have no hope rooted in this. And then you have this beautiful group of people who call themselves the church who have moved one step further and they found Psalms. Psalms is the next book of the Bible. Job, Psalms. They found God. They found this wonderful their creator who helps them make sense of life, who gives them hope and encouragement. And a lot of times we gravitate towards psalms for hope and encouragement. That's why we love to start our mornings with a psalm. When we're going through hard times, we, we lean on psalms because it gives us this clear picture of who God is. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And there's countless scriptures and psalms that bring us a little bit closer to God and a little farther away from our mess. The challenge is to mature spiritually where you get into Proverbs. Job, Psalms, Proverbs. The challenge for the Christian is to arise in spiritual maturity. Use the wisdom, the insight, the knowledge that God has given you to build a great life, to do awesome things, to establish his kingdom, to achieve his purpose in life. But, so, but Proverbs, standing by itself, seems a little simplistic, a little incomplete. So you have to keep moving. You have to keep maturing into Ecclesiastes, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And we reach Ecclesiastes and we're once again faced with these hard facts, these hard realities of life that sometimes make us question. But it's all the whole purpose is for us to just get a little bit closer to God, to, to grow in spiritual maturity, to trust God, to trust God. Because the next book of the Bible in this succession, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, is Song of Solomon, which is a book about intimacy. The purpose of God is that you would know him. That's the purpose of God. That was the purpose that was established in the Garden of Eden. For Adam to have dominion over everything was just a small piece. The overarching, the ultimate purpose of God was that he would know him, that he would walk with him. So your purpose in life is to know God. You've been given individual, amazing God dreams. And I would have been doing you a disservice if I got up here this morning and gave you a three-step plan to achieve your personal God dream. 
you deserve a personal conversation. You deserve a par personal conversation, first and foremost, with God, your creator, who put that dream in your life. You deserve that. So, little side note, little tidbit. I'm going to give you a little rundown of how you can plan that awesome thing that you have in your life. Talk to God about it. Don't ask him to explain it. Just talk to God about it. Put it all on the table. Write it down. Journal it. Whatever you got to do, talk to God about it. Research it. Have there been people that have done it before? There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes tells us. Wisdom is out there. It's in people. It's in the church. It's in the Bible. It's in the body. Get it. Grab it. Go for it. Talk to someone. Get the resources, the people necessor necessary to achieve that God dream because you were not meant to do it alone. Adam was not meant to do it alone. Amen? Amen? But the most profitable thing that you can plan is your outlook, your opinion, your judgment, your perspective on this amazing God dream that God has put in your life. So the one thing that we can all plan to do in our lives is to get to know God a little better. Amen? Get to know God a little better. That'll get you out of the bed. That'll get you doing some awesome stuff. I am living this day to get to know my creator a little bit better. I have been given the opportunity to step back in time into the Garden of Eden to walk with God. To get to know God. That is the purpose. And that is the plan. <laughs> God, what's the plan? You're getting to know me a little bit better. <laughs> Got it. That's the plan. That's the plan. Again, not to negate, you need a plan. <laughs> you're starting a business? Like, that's, there's some things that you need. You need, like, I don't know, but you need stuff. <laughs> you can't just say, I got Jesus, come and give me money. <laughs> that's not a thing. But, again, you deserve the one-on-one -on -one conversation. And if you're looking for someone to help you plan, like, hey, I'll, I love creativity. I love creative ideas. Let's get together and let's get, let's, let's color this. Yeah. So, I'm going to, um, I'm going to end by reading this chapter of Psalms. Uh, somewhere that we go for encouragement. Somewhere that we go to, to know and to see God revealed in the Bible. And I'm going to read it out of the voice translation. Uh, the voice translation, uh, I don't want to go too deep into that. Uh, it's it's kind of like the passion. Anyway. Psalm 16. It's a prayer of David. Protect me, God. For the only safety I know is found in the moments I seek you. The only safety I know is in the moments I seek you. I told you, eternal one, you are my Lord. For the only good I know in this world is found in you alone. The beauty of faith-filled people encompasses me. They are true, and my heart is thrilled beyond measure. All the while, the despair of many who abandon your goodness for the empty promises of false gods like control increases day by day. I refuse to pour out blood offerings. I refuse to sacrifice my life in the name of control. You, eternal one, are my sustenance and my life-giving cup. In that cup, you hold my future and my eternal riches. My home is surrounded in beauty. You have gifted me with abundance and a rich legacy. You have gifted me with a rich legacy 
even in the face of the hard reality that I will soon die and my generation will come to a close. You have gifted me with a rich legacy because I have spent my life, I have sacrificed my life establishing the purpose of God, which is to say that people deserve to know their creator. I will bless the eternal whose wise teachings orchestrate my days and they center my mind at night. In the moments that I find rest in the presence of God, he centers my mind back to the purpose of God. He is ever present with me. At all times, he goes before me. I will not live in fear. I will not live in fear or abandon my calling. I will not live in fear or abandon my calling because he stands at my right hand. Because my purpose in life is to get to know God a little bit better. And the only way that I'm going to do that if it's right here, if he's right by my side, if he's in my heart, if he's in my mind, so I will not live in fear. You will not live in fear as you go out and live your life. You will not abandon your calling because he is right by your side. This is a good life. This is a good life. My heart is glad and my soul is full of joy and my body is at rest even in the middle of circumstance and seemingly random life. This is a good life. Who could want for more? You will not abandon me to experience death and the grave or leave me to rot alone. You will not abandon me to experience death and the grave or leave me to rot alone alone. Instead, you direct me on the path that leads to a beautiful life. And as I walk with you, the pleasures are never ending. The pleasures are never ending and I know true joy and contentment because true joy and contentment is not found in succeeding and achieving my impossibility. True joy and contentment is found in knowing God. True joy and contentment is found in knowing God. So as we all stand... As we all stand, and I would ask you to close your eyes. I would ask you to close your eyes. And think about that promise that Michelle asked you to give to God. Think about that promise, that, that, that impossibility, that dream, that God dream, that, that God has placed in your life. Think about that thing that you gave to him. Now hold it with an open hand. Put your hands open and hold it with an open hand. This promise is a part of my life. This dream is a part of my life. It's a gift from God, but I will not grasp it in control. I will not grasp it in my minute definition of expectation. Instead, I'll hold the hand of God. That's the thing that I'm closed in on. That's the thing that I'll grasp. My relationship with God, knowing my Heavenly Father, that is the thing that I will grasp. Because as I do that, as I walk with God, as I plan to walk with God for the rest of my life, we're going to achieve so much impossibility. We're going to do so many awesome things. And I'm rooted and grounded in the fact that the purposes of the Lord will stand forever. Father, I thank you so much. 
for this beautiful group of people. I thank you for every life. You knew them before they were born, God. You love them so much and you desire to know them and for them to know you. So God, we plan to get to know you better. We ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you keep us steady on this path of life, this way of life, as we know you more and more and more. As I was reading the scripture, I was just overtaken with emotion as I was reading, I will not live in fear or abandon my calling. I will not live in fear or abandon my calling because you are always with me. If you have abandoned your calling because of fear, because things didn't go the way that you expected them to. There's hope. Your life is not over. Your life is not over. You are still getting to know God more and more and more. Not that I'm going to do this, but when I was a kid, the way that we would close out every service, (laughs) everyone would pray. People came up to the altar, people knelt at their chairs, people prayed over the message that had been given. And so my challenge this morning is for you to pray into this. Where am I at in this journey of life? Am I stuck in my story? Am I stuck in just the comfort and encouragement of God? I'm convicted to grow in my spiritual maturity. Am I stuck in this minute thinking that life is simple and everything will happen as it's supposed to? Are you stuck in a cloud of smoke like Ecclesiastes? You don't know what's going on or why it's happening this way. I would challenge us all to find ourselves in the Song of Solomon. Getting to know God more. So pray. Pray, church. Pray that you get to know God more. Pray that you get to know God more. Pray that he would reveal not control, but that he would reveal his character. Pray that he would reveal how his purpose is being established in this earth through you. How more and more people are coming to know him and the hope that he holds for all through your life. Do not get stuck in the hard realities of life. Do not get stuck in simplistic thinking that cause and effect governs this life. God is bigger than cause and effect. Do not get stuck, church, in just wanting to be comforted and encouraged by God, but not prodded to develop and to mature in God. Do not get stuck, world, in your story. Do not get stuck in your story. There is a God who loves you, who wants to know you, and wants you to know him.
Use us, God. Use us to pull people out of their stories into a heaven reality that says the purpose is to know God. Use this church to pull people out of their stories, to pull people out of their poverty and their addiction, to pull people out of abuse and neglect, out of their pride and egos. Use us to pull them out of their stories and into the song of songs. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Use this church, God, because we want to get to know you more.